tell you just a story about why you got the book that's in your hand. Sort of how did that happen? And why is it important to you? Why is that significant to, to what you all do? Um, if you looked at the cover, it's a scary picture of this person jumping out the back of an airplane. Um, and the book is a lot about leadership in dangerous contexts. And I became interested in that when I went to the leadership department at West Point. I started there in the year 2000. I figured, why not go to West Point? It's not like we're in any wars or anything. And then, uh, and then the world changed pretty quickly. And one of the first things I realized was that we were graduating, you know, 21, 22-year-old young men and women, and within nine months, they were all in combat somewhere, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, somewhere else. And so I began to ask my faculty, what do we do to prepare them for leading in dangerous places or leading in, in crisis context? You know, they've got 30 or 40 of other people's kids with them. What do we do to make sure that they get that right? And I got that RCA dog look, you know. It was just kind of like, well, we don't, we don't really teach that. And I said, well, why not? They said, well, it's not really covered in the academic journals. We only teach evidence-based content. And I said, so, I mean, if we get some evidence, You'll teach it, right? I said, sure. So I basically said, get on the plane. And I put nine people into Iraq to study crisis leadership on the ground in combat conditions in 2003. Uh, one of them was wounded very lightly, thank goodness. Uh, I think I became the first department head at West Point to get a researcher wounded in combat. Um, but we came back with an amazing amount of data. And I'll tell you about, about the studies and, and, and the data. But the, but the bigger idea was that we weren't going to talk to people about something that we didn't have good evidence to support. And I'll tell you, in the field of leadership, there is so much junk out there and so many people that are willing to stand up in front of you and talk about what they think without ever having checked about what they're telling you. And I felt like the stakes were really far too high for these young men and women to just give them war stories and pat them on the bottom and send them out the door. So that's why, we, that's why this book came into being. That's why we did all this research and all this work. And I thought as I was doing it that it was really kind of a military thing, maybe police and firefighters, you know, that it would be sort of a niche thing. <clears throat> and I was about halfway done with it. And we had a visit with about 25 managing directors from one of the big banks in New York City. They came up and they wanted to talk to us about leadership and, and find out what we were doing in the leadership department. So I told them, I said, look, I'm going to tell you about this book I'm writing and this research that we've done. And I think you'll find it interesting and kind of compelling, but this is not for you. This is about, this is about life and death situations. And, you know, you guys, you take money and you move it from one place to another. And when it goes by, you take a little out. And, and it's not the same, you know, as leading leading people on the ground in combat or, or on the side of a mountain or, or something else. I got about 20, <clears throat> 20 minutes into this presentation and one of the MDs raised his hand and he said, I don't think you understand what we do or the nature of our jobs. He said, you've never looked into the eyes of somebody that lost our firm hundreds of millions of dollars. And you know they're going to leave the firm. They're not going to be able to work in finance. They're going to lose their house. They might lose their family. And I've had people in my organization commit suicide over business deals. I said, so don't tell us that this doesn't apply to us in the same way, because a lot of what we do is like life and death. It's about people's livelihoods, and it's about people's wealth. But it's, it's, it's bigger than just a job. And that really intrigued me. So I spent about the next 18 months talking to neuropsychologists, trying to get data on whether there's a difference in terms of the human response and the effect on leadership between someone who is afraid because of a physical threat and someone who is afraid for a th for th because of a threat to their livelihood or some other deeply held um, deeply held value. And the answer that we came to after that 18 months of study is that there is no difference. There's no physical difference. If you're scared half to death because you think you just lost your family's future, the what you need in a leader 
and, and, and what you're gonna, how, the way that you're gonna react is very similar to the way you would react if you were running out of the back of an armored vehicle afraid for your life. I mean, you're looking for the same things in leaders. So I'm gonna tell you what those things are. I'm gonna tell you what we, we found. I'm gonna clip through four studies here in about three minutes just to tell you what lengths we went to to get the data and to study this. But then I'm gonna tell you what we found so that you can apply it in your own lives to the extent to which you think it matters. And I will tell you, I, I don't think it matters to you, I know it does. And one of the reasons I know it does is that we sent most of you, if not all of you, out a little survey asking you about your experience with crisis. The first question we asked you was, how many of you have been in a serious personal or professional crisis, or both, in the last two years? And in this room, that's 70% of the people in this room. 70%. And then we asked you, right now, currently, are you in a personal or, or professional, you know, serious crisis? And the answer to that is that one in three of you sitting in this room right now consider yourselves to be in a serious personal or professional crisis, and you're managing it all day. And that's something you should not only think of when you look at your neighbors here in, in this, this hall, but it's no different in your organizations. When you're walking down the hall, looking at the people who work for you, between 30 and 50% of them are having to deal with some big family crisis or, or some kind of professional crisis. And it's easy for us as leaders to forget that. And it gives us a lot of power when we recognize it and when we can, when we can talk to people understanding that they may be carrying a heck of a lot heavier a load than we think they are because they don't look like it on the outside necessarily, but they're dealing with elderly parents, they're dealing with devastating medical diagnoses, they're dealing with financial failure, they're dealing with all this kind of stuff. And so are you. And so, um, you know, it, it's ubiquitous. It happens to everybody. Um, so how do you gather data on something like this? How do you get smart so when you talk to people about crisis or you talk to people about leading in dangerous contexts, you're not just selling them some kind of snake oil? Well, we did as much data gathering as we could. The first study we did in Iraq, we moved all over Iraq by helicopter and by a Mitsubishi SUV with an orange panel on the top of it. Um, we went down to a, to a car rental place in a Kuwait City Hotel, signed all kinds of paperwork saying that under no circumstances would we ever take that into Iraq, and then drove straight into Iraq. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we kind of made this little four-person deal where we said if we, lose, if we lose the car, we're all going to chip in and pay for it. Um, so we, we talked, uh, did, did in-depth interviews in the combat zone during active combat with 175 people. Okay, it took us six weeks. We used 16 Sony tape recorders to do it. And the reason we used 16 was that there was so much dust in the air. It was 115 degrees. They would quit working before the batteries ran out. I don't think we ever had one where the batteries ran out. They would just quit. And so we gathered up all this data. We took it back to West Point and Yale, and we had it formally content analyzed by social scientists. So they would go through the text data and they would code it for themes that they didn't understand our hypotheses, but they would give us the quantitative data on what the major themes were. We also did a trust study in Mosul, uh, a really difficult place at, at, in 2003, lots of heavy fighting there. Then it got a little bit better. Now it's really bad again. Uh, and we, we had a, a researcher there who David Petraeus personally requested because he'd worked for Petraeus before and he was a known quantity. And you can't say no to a two-star general in a combat zone, but when the guy was headed out the door, I said, bring us data. And so he did. He did a magnificent trust study. He got seven articles and a book out of it. Uh, so really definitive on trust in crisis. The third uh, we did was with this parachute team that I was coaching. Uh, I spent about, <clears throat> about 800 hours a year with this team. So add that up and you figure out the weeks and everything. I made more than a thousand parachute jumps with them. And at the same time, I had a lot of access to the athletic department because of my rank and where I worked at the, at the academy. So we did a comparative study where we compared uh, the characteristics of the NCAA team sport captains with the 10 most experienced leaders on this parachute team. 
kids who had more than 500 jumps, they had competed nationally, they were instructors for the younger cadets. So we could compare student leaders in a safe environment versus a dangerous one. And then the last study we did was a more typical leadership study, uh, talking to leaders, but these were all people who were routinely leading in dangerous places and none of them were in the military. So I talked to mountain climbing guides from the Exum School in Jackson Hole, Wyoming that take people up Everest and K2. I interviewed a woman who took HD video teams into the Indian Tiger Preserves and videotaped tigers on the ground. Uh, I interviewed the SWAT team chiefs from the New York and San Francisco offices of the FBI. I interviewed large formation skydiving organizers who would take seven to ten separate aircraft and put 400 people in the air simultaneously to come together in a big formation and then separate and try to find enough room to open those parachutes before somebody came through the top of one. So these people were always leading in dangerous places and I wanted to know how they were different. And as it turns out, when you take all of these studies and you pull them all together, you begin to analyze what all these people said, there were five things that were unique to leadership in crisis or dangerous places. But, you know, we have found that this works very well for, for any kind of serious crisis, personal or professional. The first thing we found was something called inherent motivation. When we asked those team captains, to rank order, we asked them to rank order some leadership competencies in terms of their personal strength. Their number one strength was motivating. That was, that was what they were all about, because if you're, if you're leading someone around a rubber track, you have to motivate them to want to do that. But when we asked those parachute team leaders the same thing, it was a complete reversal. Motivating was second from the bottom of a list of nine. And as it turns out, the reason that's true is that when people are in crisis, they're already upset, they are already spun up, they do not need a motivator. <laughs> you know, they need someone who brings the room down and kind of calms everybody. And, and our interviews of these, these in extremist leaders, and you can read about all this stuff in that book, but our, our interviews with them revealed them to be very quiet professionals. They weren't boastful, they were very humble, they were quiet, and they tended to bring the room down. Hey, no big deal. You know, that's what, that's what people need. And at the end of the day, leadership is about giving people what they need. It's not about your style or, you know, your preference. It's about giving them what they need. So if the parachutists were not about motivating, what was their number one competency? It was learning. And these are experts. These, they have expert licenses. They're instructors. But in, in crisis, the, the people who are good at it and practiced at it are focused outward all the time. They're focused on the environment that in this case is trying to kill them. But even in a business context, the best crisis leaders are not fretting about, you know, what's going to happen to them or what's going to happen to their people. They're focused on the business environment. They're focused on the threat. And they're focused on things that are going to improve their position. And it's the same thing with these crisis leaders. They're focused outward all the time. And as it turns out, that's the best way to control emotions. If, you, if you're under some kind of threat or if people in your organization are angry or, or afraid, and they're showing this emotionality, it's because they're not task focused. And we would never tell a cadet, you know, try to control your fear or your emotions because that turns them inward and then it makes it worse. I mean, have you ever, have you ever told somebody who's upset, hey, get control of yourself? <laughs> it always goes badly, you know, because they focus inward. But if you focus people on a task, and I don't want to get too far into the neuropsychology, but it crowds out the ability to turn inward on yourself. And if you really focus on what you're doing, you're braver than you think.